uh, hi guys uh, good evening everybody once again and uh, i saw all your messages uh, hi hi great great to see all of you joining in and uh, in good time so like i promised we'll start on time today and not much introduction um, we have a lot of work to do and we have a lot of topics to revise as many as possible so uh, after seeing your greetings i think there were a lot of good greetings hi good evening good evening everybody okay dr mishra vladmir ramesh and Altif Hussain, Kamal Sharma, everybody, hi. So what we'll do, we'll start our discussions first and we'll get to the uh, pleasantries and to the questions later. So whatever I have to discuss, uh, what all I feel is important, we'll do now. I have got a, a set of questions. You must have seen these questions in the revisions and those who have the prep ladder notes and those who have the app must have seen them. But uh, the idea is that we recall them so that we have a good revision before the exams. Take care. Chalo, let us start with the first question. Now, question number one. Which of the following is not a criteria for preterm labor? Any labor which is uh, before 37 weeks is preterm labor. So when we say that the labor is, uh, let's say, starting at uh, 34 weeks to 37 weeks, we call it late preterm labor. And 30 to 34 weeks this is the preterm labor which we usually get and this is the preterm labor the usual preterm labor or the general preterm labor which we are worried about because why it is more important before 34 weeks the lung is not mature so late ptl late preterm labor is 34 to 37 weeks so se kya hota hai? that the lung is already mature we are not worried too much so that's why when a patient is in labor before 34 weeks, it's of more concern. So that is 32 to 34 weeks. But yes, 28 to 32 weeks is known as the early preterm labor. Now, the early preterm labor is what we are worried about even more because lung is not mature and the baby is really, really premature. So 28 to 32 is early preterm labor. Now, why 28? You know very well because after 28 weeks, only we can save the babies. After 28 weeks, the baby is known to be viable. Viable matlab, we can save that baby. So when we know it is 28 and beyond, we can save the baby, but the mother goes into labor. Matlab, the patient goes into labor, let's say, at 31 weeks. So I know it is a viable baby, but it is really, really preterm. It is known as early preterm labor. So yes, 28 to 32 is early preterm labor. 32 to 34 is the usual preterm labor, which we see. And after 34 to 37 weeks is known as the late preterm labor. And we are not worried about it too much because 34 weeks per lungs will get mature. So you know very well that preterm labor is all about lung maturity. If the lung is mature, we are happy. Okay. So now, 34 weeks and before, if I want to give tocolysis, if I want to give tocolysis, okay. If I want to give tocolysis i will give if preterm labor is before 34 weeks only so now you understand the meaning of what i was trying to say if there is preterm labor before 34 weeks lung is not mature and that preterm labor i want to stop so when preterm labor is before 34 weeks that is one thing one criteria that before 34 weeks only it is important to stop the labor if suppose if a patient is in uh, preterm labor at 36 weeks i will let it deliver it's all right it is not uh, still 37 it is not term but i know that the lung will be mature so i'm not worried about the preterm labor which is after 34 and before 37 but if it is before 34 weeks i will give tocolysis you know tocolysis not drugs for tocolysis like magnesium sulfate and uh, beta agonists and uh, uh, prostaglandin inhibitors like NSAIs, all these tocolytics are given only before 34 weeks. All right. So, um, how do we know that the patient is in preterm labor? So, we know that the patient is in preterm labor if the cervix is more than one centimeter dilated, more than one centimeter dilated cervix and more than 80% effaced cervix so this is the basic criteria and she should have contractions at least four in 20 minutes or eight in 60 minutes like what is written in this 
question also. So which of the following is not a criteria? So cervix is more than one centimeter dilated. That is contractions are eight contractions in 60 minutes. Yes. And more than 80% effaced. Yes. Cervix directed posteriorly. Now that is what is wrong. See, uh, one thing you should know. What is the meaning of this posterior and anterior cervix? So when I show you that, see the uterus is like this. Uterus is antiverted like this. All of us know this is the cervix and cervix is downwards and forwards. So when the cervix is downwards and forwards, now as the cervix, as the uterus becomes bigger, see this is antiversion uterus, isn't it? This is known as the antiversion. Now as the uterus becomes bigger, it becomes straighter with the pregnancy. As the pregnancy advances, it becomes straighter. And later, the uterus will lie down like this. The uterus will lie down like this. And now the cervix is midline. And at the time of delivery, the uterus will be somewhat like this. See, it is now directed anteriorly. So in the initial few days, it is downwards and backwards. And later it is midline or central. And then it is anterior. So if the cervix is posterior, she is not going to deliver very easily. It's going to take some time. If the cervix is central, it is better. She may deliver in a few weeks. If the cervix is anterior, then she is about to deliver. So, this is about the position of cervix. So, yes, remember we have discussed something called the Bishop score. What is the Bishop score? The Bishop score is what is going to take care of the cervical dilatation, cervical effacement, cervical position. Okay and cervical consistency. And last but not the least is the station of the head. So where do I write that? Okay, station of the head. So these are the few things which are taken care of in a Bishop score. So let me try and explain what I'm trying to tell you here. I'm trying to say, how do you know that the patient is going to be in labor? If the bishop score is very good, she's going to go into labor fast. If the bishop score is bad, then she's not going to go into labor. So I examine a woman. I do a per vaginal examination. Now, when I do a per vaginal examination, in that PV, I see the cervix is very soft. Cervix is two centimeters open. And the cervix is not posterior, cervix is anterior, like I showed you in the diagrams. Cervix is not posterior, cervix is anterior. That means she's about to deliver. So that is what is the position which I was trying to tell you. If it is uh, posterior, it is central or it is anterior. So cervix is soft, it is open, it is anterior and it is more than 80% effaced. Effaced matlab, it has become shorter in length. So then it is a good bishops. And the station of the head is the fifth parameter. Station of the head is at plus two, plus three, plus four. The more it is lower in the pelvis, the better is the chances of delivery. So that is the bishop score. So why did I tell you the bishop score? One of the parameters is mentioned here. That service is more than one centimeter dilated. Okay, she's getting into labor. More than eight contractions in 60 minutes, fine. She's getting into labor and it is more than 80% effaced. So all of this is telling me that she's going to labor. But the cervix is posterior. Huh, this one doesn't tell me that she's going to labor because cervix has to be either central or anterior. So that's why Bishop's score and this preterm labor things are mixed up because the question came like that. It goes to say that you should understand everything. So what is a Bishop's score? Bishop's score tells us that what is the likelihood that the patient is going to deliver? What is the possibility that the patient is going to deliver? So we say if a bishop score is less than or equal to four, we say it's a poor bishops. And if the bishop score is more than or equal to nine, 
we say it's a good bishops and five to eight five to eight we leave it with the obstetricians you know we decide what to do at five to eight if the patient is uh, five to eight then the obstetrician does the findings and he decides whether i want to deliver or i can continue depending on the maternal conditions like pih and gdm so let's not go into that discussion five to eight is my it's my in charge i'm in charge of five to eight you should know Less than four is bad bishops and more than, uh, uh, you know, nine, uh, more than equal to nine is a good bishops. So now in this patient, when we are saying that cervix is directed posterior. So this one criteria does not tell us properly whether the patient is in about to go into preterm labor or not. So the answer to this question is that the cervix is directed posteriorly is the wrong thing here. So let's see what you guys have been writing here ever since we started the discussion. D, 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 D. All right. Adenomyces versus fibroid. Okay, fine. We'll discuss adenomyces versus fibroid. Uh, let me just finish this. Uh, okay, okay. Yes. Uh, um, Dabu Singh will come to adenomyces. Don't worry. Mm, Endometrosin less than three. No roll after 34. Lung maturity. Okay, fine, fine. Maximum, maximum, maximum. Answer D, D, D. Mm, consistency. Adenomyces versus fibroid. Adenomyces versus fibroid. Adenomyces versus fibroid. Dabu Singh. <laughs> You're, you're bombarding with the same question. Okay, we'll get into that adenomyces versus fibroid. I'm not going to forget it. Okay, chalo. Abhi jo mood hai, us pe baat karte hai, And uh, let's move on and see question, uh, next question. I've not numbered the questions. I don't know why. But uh, see the next question. Which of the coagulating factors decreases in pregnancy? Everything increases in pregnancy. All clotting factors except 11 and 13. So 11 and 13, yes, 11 and 13 don't increase. They These will fall. They fall in pregnancy. Very, very important. Rest all will increase. So pregnancy is a good coagulation condition. It's a hypercoagulable condition. It's good that in pregnancy, coagulation is good. What is the coagulation? What is going to be good for the patient? If the coagulation is good, then suppose any mother who delivers, any mother who delivers will bleed a little bit at least. You're a good obstetrician. You will give control cord traction and you will make sure the plasma comes out. You will give oxytocin when the anterior shoulder of the baby comes out. And then you'll massage the uterus, which is a very good step in PPH management. But still, she'll bleed at least 200 ml. Delivery will cause some bleeding, isn't it? Now, that 200 ml can easily become 400 ml if the woman has a poor coagulability. So nature is very, very smart. Nature decided or the Almighty decided, whichever you believe is stronger. So nature decided that let there be good coagulation in pregnancy. So when the plasma separates, the base of the uterus will bleed. We know that very well that this placenta here, this placenta here is going to separate. Moment this placenta separates, the base of this, see, see the base of all of this placenta is going to pour. So when this base is going to bleed, I want the coagulation in this base to be very good. So nature has taken care. All the coagulation factors have been increased in pregnancy. So when she bleeds in pregnancy, there'll be there'll be lesser blood loss during labor because the coagulation is good. So fibrinogen, particularly they ask. So fibrinogen levels. This will come as exam question also. Fibrinogen in pre-pregnant level in pre-pregnancy it's around three hundred milligrams per deciliter and in pregnancy pregnancy the fibrinogen level becomes around 450 to maybe even a little bit more milligrams per deciliter so all clotting factors increases and especially fibrinogen increases and it's good to have a hypercoagulable condition in pregnancy all right so that's good but yes there's also one more thing coagulation is increased okay let me write that coagulation is increased but the blood is thinner. There's another benefit to this information because of this. See, coagulation is more and blood is thinner. This also you must remember. Why blood is thinner? Because RBC increases and the fluids increases much more. So that's why there is net Hemodilution, hemodilution, hemodil I've written, okay? So what is the meaning of this statement now? Blood is thinner in pregnancy. How does that help? I'll tell you that. Why is the blood thinner? Because see, RBCs from pre-pregnant to pregnant, RBC increase, fluid increases. 
but fluid increases much more. So the fluid is much, I mean, much more rise than the RBC rise. So when the fluid rises more and the RBC rise is also there, but it is not as much as the fluid rise. Fluid rise in pregnancy is more, RBC rise is not so much. So the net result of this is that there is hemodilution. That means the blood is thinner. Now, how is that beneficial? When the woman bleeds in the delivery, when the woman bleeds after delivery, the blood is thinner. That means there is more fluid loss than RBC loss. So wonderful arrangement by nature again. So one, coagulation is more good for pregnancy because bleeding happens, clotting jaldi ho jayega. And the blood is thinner. That whatever blood is lost during the delivery, that blood is more fluid rather than RBC. RBC loss is less because the blood is thinner. So fluid loss is more. So it's a wonderful mechanism that in pregnancy, the blood is thinner and it is likely to coagulate more. All right. So yes, answer, which are all, which are the falling coagul factors decreases in pregnancy. So yes, 11 decrees in pregnancy, 11 and 13 decrees in pregnancy. Let's see. Uh, okay. Yes, PDF will be available. You will get the PDF for all of this, what we're discussing. Don't worry. Uh, oh, yeah, but I'm uh, every time I'm deleting the writing part. So you want the writing part also? You just want the questions. You want the writing part, then I'll not delete it, okay? I'll keep this. I think I'm going to keep this now because I'm deleting every time I'm... Uh, I think that's why it is going to be a problem. But the video is there. Why you, why, why you guys worried? Whatever I'm writing is there on a YouTube video. So you can always get back to the YouTube video and you can see that even if you don't get the PDF with the uh, written material, you can get back to this. Yeah, but you'll have to listen to me again. Yeah, that's one problem. Okay. Okay, I'll keep the writing part. Okay, I'll keep the writing part. Thanks for writing that. And... Uh, uh, decreases, decreases, 11, 13 decreases, all right. That's all right. Hemodilation, hemodilation, fine. Shall I'll not delete things now. I'll write smaller then. Shall uh, I've planned only a PPT and not blank slides. Uh, somehow I forgot to do that. Which of the following constitutes the modified biophysical profile? Guys, whatever happens, whenever you go for this exam, please read your surveillance chapter. The surveillance chapter, I'm sure I've taught you. If you've not gone through me uh, with the classes, I'm sure you've gone through me uh, with the prep ladder forum. So either way, please read the chapter on surveillance, intrapartum surveillance and antipartum surveillance. Antipartum means during pregnancy, how will you do the surveillance? And then during labor, how will you do the surveillance? So surveillance is everything in obstetrics. Diabetes, hypertension, IUGR, twins, heart disease, Whatever is the problem in obstetrics, how do I make sure that the pregnancy continues properly till term and the baby is born healthy? How do I make sure of all of this thing happening? I make it sure only by my surveillance. Surveillance is the best tool of an obstetrician. I'm an obstetrician because I know surveillance. That's the importance of these chapters. So surveillance will always come in exam. See, they've asked bio, uh, this biophysical profile so many times. So yes, all of you know, that the antipartum APS I'm writing, antipartum surveillance is the daily fetal movement count. Count the number of times the baby moves. And then the non-stress test, the biophysical profile, the Doppler ultrasonography, see the flow patterns. I mean, these are the important ones. And then what are the intrapartum surveillance? Intrapartum, okay? Intrapartum surveillance means while the woman is about to deliver. So intrapartum surveillance is when the patient is having labor. So the best test here is the cardiotocography. So the cardiotocography is that single most important intrapartum surveillance. That yes, remember I told you with the contractions, what happened to the uh, fetal heart rate, isn't it? So early deceleration and uh, late deceleration, variable deceleration, all that. Please, you have to read that and go. So I would put my uh, mark on these non-stress tests, biophysical profile, and CTG. These you have to read. If you have time, please read the Doppler also because Doppler generally they ask in the PG entrance exams. But you guys do not leave your rooms without reading NST, biophysical profile, and cardiotopography. Now, what is um, bi biophysical profile? All of you know biophysical profile is the non-stress test. 
plus on the ultrasound we see some parameters like the fetal movements and the fetal breathing fetal breathing see baby does not breathe inside the mother's uterus when the baby is inside the uterus is surrounded by lycra so he's not breathing inside isn't it he's breathing by the umbilical cord the oxygenation is coming from the umbilical cord so how do we see breathing movements see every time the baby swallows amniotic fluid baby does this you know see see when we swallow also our chest expands a little bit so when we do put a ultrasound beam from the side of the baby's chest we see the chest every time the baby swallows it's like slightly chest will expand so when the baby is swallowing amniotic fluid that shows as a breathing movement so ultrasound plus fetal movement uh, ultrasound fetal movement ultrasound fetal breathing and then fetal tone that is one active flexion movement and extension movement of the upper or lower limb the tone and the amniotic fluid index so two marks are given to all of these parameters and 10 out of 10 is a perfect biophysical profile 8 by 10 with good amniotic fluid index is also good so 10 by 10 is a good biophysical profile if it is 8 by 10 but whatever parameter is low if the afi is good then also we'll say it's a good biophysical profile Anything which is less than or equal to 6 by 10, less than or equal to 6 by 10 is bad news. Then we are thinking in terms of delivery. So this is the, uh, you know, what is biophysical profile? All of us know. We should know a little bit more. What is the use of the biophysical profile? So every uh, good pregnancy has a 10 by 10. We know that. But if there is a high risk pregnancy and it is 8 by 10, that doesn't mean you deliver it immediately. It is 8 by 10. One of the parameters is not good, but the amniotic fluid index is good. Chalo, continue karo. let the pregnancy go on let not terminate now if the amniotic fluid index is also less then 8 by 10 is also bad news so slightly excess i told you right now don't worry you should know biophysical profile there are five parameters now what is the modified biophysical profile is the question here that is the simplest question which they can ask you in mca exam and that is amniotic fluid plus nst i'm a very very uh you know uh very strong proponent of the modified biophysical profile i barely have the time for my patients to go through a biophysical profile every week what do i do nst is done every week for high risk patients we do twice a week so every patient we do twice a week nst and once a week i'm not a fluid index if it is fine continue the pregnancy for one more week yes the ultrasound which is going to take the fetal movement fetal breathing and fetal tone that's going to take even more time so nst in afi is fine go ahead continue the pregnancy so modified biophysical profile is used by a lot of uh, uh, gynecologists like me and i'm very uh, very very strong proponent of this so yes that is the modified biophysical profile actually uh what did you all guys uh ask me right now you want to teach me abortion please some hindi also all right uh sharuk may hindi mein bol to sakta but my tamil friends hai wo sab gussa ho jayenge ha to unke liye mujhe fir tamil mein bolna padega तो वो और मेरे बंगाली फ्रेंड्स बोलेंगे तुम आप बंगाली में बोल दो तो थोड़ा प्रॉब्लम हो जाएगा ना तो देखते हैं देखते हैं हम लोग कैसे मैनेज करेंगे लैंग्वेज अभी विल कीप इट एट इंग्लिश व्हाट डज नॉट इंक्रीज इन प्रेगनेंसी रेस्पिरेटरी रेट डज नॉट इंक्रीज इन प्रेगनेंसी मोहम्मद दैट डज नॉट इंक्रीज दैट दैट्स द वन व्हिच इज गिविंग अ लॉट ऑफ कंफ्यूजन Oh, what did I miss? Uh, explain cord compression. Hmm. Hindi chalta hai, right? Ramesh Chaudhary, I have some doubts in OBG. Please send me. Let's see what all I can do. Hi, I'm not a fluid. I'm not a fluid. Question is coming, guys. We'll come to that. So, cord compression. Yeah, that's a good question to ask. What is cord compression? So, what happens? The umbilical cord is. Uh, you know, a short umbilical cord, cord is, uh, normal umbilical cord is how much? Normal cord length is, normal cord is around 50 to 60 centimeters and less than 20 is small, a short cord rather, that's a better word. And more than 300 centimeters, yes, that's what the book says, 3 meters lumbi cord, right? 3 meters and longer is a long cord. So the cord might be twined around the neck, around the hand, around the chest. It's not going to cause much problem. Cord if it is decent length, even around 100 centimeters, if it is, it'll be 
entwined around some part of the body of the baby. So that cord may get a little stressed. So if it gets a little compressed during labor, minimal variability of the heart can of the heartbeat of the baby can happen because of cord compression and it recovers mostly in 30 seconds so when there is cord compression the fall in the heartbeat see the heartbeat is going like this heartbeat goes down then comes up and then goes down more more and then small so see this is variable see here it is less slightly more this is much more so this is called variable deceleration so when we say variable deceleration, that means that the heartbeat is going uh, going down by a different uh, amount every time. So that's why we say variable deceleration because of cord compression is the most common deceleration, variable deceleration, all right? And it is mostly normal. But which, which deceleration is always normal? Variable deceleration is the most common deceleration and it is mostly normal. But the Early deceleration is always normal. Early deceleration is because of, because of head compression. Please, early deceleration, it is because of head compression. So that you should not miss. Okay. Right. Chale, let's move on and see something else. Let's see this question. Yes. Uh, what is the half-life of letrozole? So I gave you this diagram before I'm going to explain you this one. So when we say... Uh, from the hypothalamus, the GnRH comes out first. The GnRH is going to act on the pituitary and gonadotropin. See, GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to release the gonadotropins. What are the gonadotropins? FSH and LH. FSH acts on the ovary to make the follicle grow and the follicle makes estrogen, which acts on the uterus to cause the proliferation of the endometrium. Right? And then enough estrogen is made. See the red arrow. See this red arrow is giving a feedback. That is going to give a feedback to the brain to cause the LH surge. What caused the LH surge? The high estrogen amount. The high estrogen amount gives a feedback to the brain and the brain sends the LH. LH will rupture the follicle. Can you see the LH here? It's going to rupture the follicle and that follicle is going to release an egg and the follicle is going to become yellow in color like I've shown you here and that is going to be called the uh, copstudium. Copstudium makes progesterone which now makes the endometrium secretory. So I'll try to make it secretory now. See, it has become secretory it has become juicy full of secretions for the embryo to come and get implanted so this is what is basic and we have done this many times in our app in the physiology of menstruation chapter you have read it well what happens when i'm going to give clomiphene citrate clomiphene citrate is going to be a hypothalamic estrogen receptor blocker see i've shown you here the clomiphene citrate is here it is a hypothalamic estrogen receptor blocker. So brain thinks there is no estrogen in the body. Brain thinks there is no estrogen. So the brain will increase the FSH. So when there is clomiphene citrate, the FSH increases and the high FSH stimulates the ovary to make eggs. So we use this in PCOS for ovulation induction. What else we can do? We can use letrozole also. We know the androgens are converted to estrogens by aromatase enzyme in the ovary and in the periphery, in the fats also. So this conversion of androgens to estrogens is by aromatase enzyme and letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor. See this red line here? It's an aromatase inhibitor. So when there is less aromatase, there will be lesser estrogen. And when there is less estrogen, again the brain, the hypothalamus gets a message that there is no estrogen. Brain increase the FSH again. So whether you give clomiphene citrate, or you give letrozole. Both work for increasing the FSH. Letrozole also, also increases FSH as does clomiphene citrate. Whatever is the mechanism of action, both of these have the action of ultimately increasing the follicular stimulating hormone. And that will act on the ovary and make much bigger follicles. So that's why we say follicular stimulating hormone should increase to make better follicles. And I want to use that for PCOS, isn't it? Drug of choice for ovulation induction is asked so many times in the exam. And now the drug of choice is letrozole. Some old guidebooks are still giving clomiphene citrate as the drug of choice, which is the wrong answer. Please go ahead and say that letrozole is the drug of choice for ovulation induction. So when a woman is having PCOS, she's having multiple small follicles. And I want one follicle to become big. So for that, increase FSH is required. So that will make one big follicle with one oocyte, which is going to rupture. So for the FSH to increase in size, uh, increase in amount, I want to increase the stimulation of the pituitary from the hypothalamus. Now, why will the hypothalamus stimulate the pituitary? 
because there is less estrogen in the body. How do we reduce the estrogen in the body? By giving either clomphen citrate or giving letrozole. So letrozole inhibits the conversion of androgens to estrogens, less estrogen. Clomphen citrate inhibits the hypothalamus, hypothalamus estrogen receptors. So ultimately reduce the estrogen and the brain will stimulate the pituitary to make more FSH. Increase the FSH to get better follicles. So basically it is that. How do you do ovulation induction? You increase the FSH. Yes, we are doing a quick revision. This is called rapid revision. And even if you did not understand, you can play all of this over, all over again. So don't get upset if this is going a little fast. Because I know that some of us have not revised. Most of us have revised, but some of us were reading surgery, medicine, pediatrics. So there's so many things. So if you're feeling that this is going a little fast, don't worry. Go ahead. Aram say, play it on slow speed and listen we are going to understand this because it's going to come in the exam. PCOS, if it doesn't come, what will happen? No? Kandipa, or Kandi Padipa. PCOS, we will come to the exam. Understand everybody? Okay. When we say we want the FSS to increase, we have two major methods. One is clomphene citrate and one is letrozole. So when letrozole or clomphene citrate are compared, the drug of choice is letrozole. Why letrozole is the drug of choice? Because better endometrium. The endometrium health is better. Better follicular growth. And we are very happy with letrozole because it reduces the incidence of twins. Now, don't say that twins are better than single. You know, some people have one child and now they're trying for a second pregnancy and you give clomphene citrate and she gets twins or triplets. Nobody wants so many children, right? So, yes, twins are good if they have just one set of twins. Sometimes clomphene citrate will give a horror that they have two children, they're trying for pregnancy and they get twins now. So, they have four children now. So yes, nobody minds children, but ultimately your two was fine and now we have four children. So, you know, that kind of thing. So we don't want twins. Clomphene citrate, almost 8 to 10% of twin is the incidence with clomphene citrate. Up to 8%, they say. Letrozole, it is less than 5%. So letrozole is better for the endometrium. It is better for the rate of twins. And yes, letrozole has much lesser side effects like anomalies. The problem of fetal anomalies is more with clomphene citrate. Hmm? That is the reason why letrozole is the drug of choice now. Now, the question here is, what is the half-life of letrozole? Now, letrozole finishes off in 48 hours. That's why side effects are much lesser. It causes some dizziness. But clomphene citrate, the half-life is almost 10 days. And then it can cause the visual scotomas. It causes the hot flushes also. And it causes a lot of headaches. So this visual scotomas tell us to stop the treatment with the clomphene citrate. But yes, that's in very high doses. Generally, how much do we start clomphene citrate? 50 milligrams per day. And uh, yes, I can write that. 50 milligrams per day. And letrozole is 2.5. The starting dose is 2.5 milligrams per day. Both of these drugs are given 2.5 and that is 50. Both of these drugs are given for five days in the beginning of the month. Roughly, mostly we start by the second day of the menstrual cycle till the sixth day of the menstrual cycle. We give this. All right. Chalo, I hope you can see me well. Okay. Um, let's see. What all did you respond with in so far? Uh, I'm not a fluid in which we can Tamil. Okay. Um, Mr. PUBG has asked me how to mm, see the A5. A5 seen by, uh, you know, by, um, what happened? Yeah, fine. Amniotic fluid index is seen by calculating the four pockets of amniotic fluid. So the four pockets, when see that, there's a fetus here in the, so we have four pockets, you know, one, two, three, and four. These four pockets of amniotic fluid are uh, charted by the ultrasound. So four pockets and the arithmetic sum of that is taken. So suppose this is two, this is three, this is three, this is four. So this makes uh, 12 centimeters AFI in this example. So arithmetic sum. That's always a very simple one. 
Hi, Krishna Pal Singh Rathor. How are you? Um, and great to see you, Paris. And uh, vacuum and forces both use after plus two session. Yes, Ramesh Chaudhary. It is correct that uh, we now in modern obstetrics. It's a good question. Uh, it is not related to the. Please ask related questions to the question uh, to the topic we are doing. It is best, but yes, I will not ignore anything because it's a revision class. So what I say that yes, please understand. Clomiphens, uh, sorry, uh, we're talking about uh, forceps and vacuum. So, sorry. So, when you're talking about forceps and vacuum in modern obstetrics, we should do safe obstetrics. We should not try stunts. So, plus two and below, we are sure. Remember why? Because plus two and below, when the head is at plus two, we know that the surety of delivery is much, much higher. So, then only forceps and vacuum is supplied. All right? Good. That is what is modern. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. So, uh, Ramya, Ramya has asked me a question that explained the most common cause of shock. Can you tell me this? Because somebody asked me adenomyces and uh, fibroids and now you're asking me about shock. Slightly unrelated to the topic we're doing. So, we'll come back to this. Please remind me, Ramya and Abhishek. Yes, remind me to come to this. Late distillation, most common, yes. Uh, regarding this, some little cord compression, early type 1, early, okay, fine, fine, you got this correct. And uh, okay, now the answers. So, uh, difference between D antigen, parental D antigen, please, from RH assimilation, it's coming in the class later. Okay, PCOs are how many follicles? That's a good question, Satish. Those who have the old preplatinum nodes two years back, uh, yes, please understand. Earlier, the criteria was actually 12 follicles per ovary. Now it has changed to 20. So more than 20 follicles per ovary is PCOS. Okay, it's not 12 anymore. So good you asked me that question. Um, drug of choice, I already told you, it's letrozole. You can ask me doubts on Telegram. Uh, Ramesh Chaudhary. Mm. Um, Ab Anubhav, please uh, take this into account. Uh, Ramesh has asked me that, can he ask me doubts on uh, Telegram? If we have a forum on Telegram to give answers, uh, uh, Anubhav, please get back to me regarding that. I cannot promise um, whether it is available for everybody. If there's a preplatter forum, because I'm there on the preplatter forum of uh, this one, I know I'm a little slow off late, but yes, from uh, last few days, I've started answering again. So preplatter forum on Facebook is the only forum which is officially connected with preplatter. Please stick to that. If there's a telegram forum, which is coming up and you can ask me doubts on that, I'll have to ask the team and Anubhav, please get back to this because the students have asked, right? Okay. Okay. Um, maximum. Maximum. Blood pressure, Casanova, maximum blood pressure. We'll get to that. Actually, uh, if we say blood pressure, initially it falls in pregnancy. Then it returns back to normal in the third trimester. So I'm not saying it's going to increase. So if that is your question, then blood pressure doesn't have to increase in pregnancy. Initially, it returns, it comes down a little bit in the first trimester. And by the third trimester, it comes back to the normal. Suppose her blood pressure is 130 by 80 in the, uh, uh, when she gets pregnant. It'll come down to 110 by 80 or 110 by 90 by 60 also in the early pregnancy. And later in the third trimester, it'll come back to 130 by 80. It does not have to increase in pregnancy. You know, there's no uh, you know, physiological hypertension. There's nothing like that, all right? So that was also a good question. Um, okay, pertaining to the topic, yes. Uh, okay. Mm. Uh, which of the following is a better drug for uh, reproductive age? Yeah. Uh... See, letrozole, Sushant, don't get confused, uh, Sushant. Uh, letrozole should be used for older patient and not for... See, oh, good, you asked me this question. Good, Sushant. Letrozole or citrate. I think I'll take away all this. Uh, yeah, we'll just don't read the next question. Yeah, I'll keep it here. So, 
Letazole or clomphenicitride, both of these drugs are used obviously in the reproductive age only because we need these drugs for ovulation induction and for the follicles to grow and the follicles to uh, give an egg so that pregnancy can happen. So letazole and clomphenicitride, we are talking about ovulation induction and this ovulation induction is done only in reproductive age. Obviously, these women only need pregnancy. So 20 to 40 is generally the age where we'll be using these drugs, reproductive age. Yes, you are correct that letazole is old, used for older women who have CA breast with the estrogen receptor positive type of CA breast and to give them anti-estrogenic action we give letrozole for a follow-up of breast cancer or tamoxifen is a better drug isn't it so letrozole is not even discussed much in uh, CA breast it is generally the tamoxifen which is discussed so old age when we give letrozole it is the purpose of the anti-estrogenic action but tamoxifen is the way better drug to be used as an anti-estrogenic drug Okay, so not letrozole, and I'm, I'm anyway, I'm not an uh, expert on CA breast, but I'm telling you the older women which you're thinking it is for the purpose of CA breast, younger women we can use letrozole for some other indication that is for induction of ovulation. Okay, so uh, don't get confused, same drugs can be used for many things, isn't it? Um, let's say uh, carboprost, carboprost is a prostaglandin. What do we use it for in obstetrics? We use it for PPH management, correct? But the same carboprost and prostaglandins are used for ulcer healing in surgery. So the indication of letrozole can be many other drugs. So I'm talking like an uh, obstetrician and gynecologist, I'm supposed to talk about letrozole for the purpose of ovulation induction. See breast, my surgeon friends will take care of uh, that discussion. All right, Chalo. I hope I've cleared your confusion. Um, Oh, there's so many questions. I think there are so many of you guys. And um, magnesium sulfate toxicity, yeah, loss of knee jerks. Okay, uh, let's not digress from the topic. We'll get. I'll get to all your questions. Okay, uh, because there's uh, the you know a lot of questions on the chat, so I don't want to miss out anybody's uh, doubts. So if we uh, stick to the topic which we are discussing, it'll be better. After that, uh, I'm not in any hurry today because uh, since yesterday was um, uh, you know just an introduction to what we're going today. So, I'm in no hurry. We'll try to do as many doubts as possible. Okay? Chal. Let's see question, uh, next question. That is, a 29-year-old lady with previous classical season section presents with breach in her second pregnancy. It is 34 weeks today and breach is confirmed on the ultrasound. She requests that a trial of normal vagina delivery should be given. What is the best advice for her? Now, forget uh, the question. Let me just tell you a basic. Previous one... LSCS. Yes, previous two also we can give a trial that is there in research setups, but mostly previous one LSCS trial can be given trial of normal delivery in a in a institute we can give. And there should be no CPD. There should be no cephalopelvic disproportion. So trial of normal vaginal delivery can be given in an institutional setup with an experienced obstetrician to take care of the patient. And suppose the trial is not working, we can immediately do a cesarean section, isn't it? That's why an institute. Don't do it in a primary health center or even a district center. Sometimes people say better to do in an institute, tertiary care setup. Okay. So there should not be any cephalopelvic disproportion. The baby should be uh, clinically assessed, the size of the baby and the pelvis should be assessed by a gynecologist. And if everything is fine, then only give a trial. And the chance of rupture, rupture chance in labor is only 0.5 to 2%. 0.5 to 2% rupture chance is there. 0 0.5, I don't know why it is not coming. 0 0.5 to 2%. Now, when we talk about the classical cesarean section, classical cesarean section is in the upper segment of the uterus, upper segment. So when we see the uterus, this is the uterus. And when we give a lower segment cesarean section, it is here. And a classical cesarean is given up. So lower segment, yes, that's the first topic I teach you these days in the live classes that the lower segment does not contract, it retracts in labor. When the patient is in labor, the lower segment retracts, the upper segment contracts. So we give only lower segment cesarean sections always. Why? Because next time when she's delivering, the 
incision of the previous cesarean is in the lower segment. Even if I do a normal delivery in the next pregnancy, then the part which I had made an incision is not contracting, it is retracting. So when it is retracting, we know it is not going to rupture because it is not taking part in a contraction. Lower segment is a passive segment. It relaxes or it retracts. Upper segment contracts. So when the upper segment is contracting, that will not rupture the uterus because the scar is in the lower segment. Lower segment cesarean, give a trial next time in institutional setup under supervision of an obstetrician who is experienced. Now, if it is a classical cesarean section, which is in the upper segment, do not give a trial. No trial in next delivery. In next delivery. Why no trial in next delivery? Because rupture chance, rupture chance is 8 to 10 percent. When the rupture chance is 8 to 10 percent, how can you go ahead and give the patient a trial? So that's why classical no trial. Previous cesarean, we can give a trial in an institutional setup. Now, with this information, go and see the question. The question is very clear. This patient with the previous classical cesarean section, rest all is kahani. Rest all adala peri kade. Adala You Everything is kahani. Please understand, they are trying to confuse you by giving all this information. Previous classical section with breach, and you feel, yeah, breach me to trial, they sakte hai, sir says breach me trial, they do, but then breach cannot, can we give a trial with the previous LSCS? So please understand, there are multiple things in this question, but the first line you see, first line is classical cesarean, no trial possible, end of discussion. Classical cesarean section, do a cesarean next time. So the answer is, plan cesarean section at term 37 weeks end of this question very simple now you want to talk about variations let's talk suppose this was not the question the question was suppose previous lscs now if it is previous lower segment again the answer would have been here even if lower segment why because the baby is in breach if the baby is in breach, then it is called a complicated, uh, I mean, uh, breach with a previous CS. There are two things, okay? There's a breach and there's a cesarean. So it is called a complicated breach. Suppose there's a breach and there's a twin pregnancy. First is a breach and it's twins. Again, it is complicated breach. Complicated breach, do cesarean. But since this is 34 weeks and it is breach, so we can wait till... We can wait till 37 weeks and see at 37 weeks that yes, if the if the baby turns by itself to a cephalic, we can give a trial. So if this question, if this question was 34 weeks, previous lower segment cesarean and breach, wait till 37 if the baby spontaneously moves to cephalic, I'll give a trial. If it is still breach at term with previous CSAs, then I'll go into a repeat cesarean section. Please go ahead and re-listen to whatever I said about this question. I'm sure I've not blurted anything wrong so far and I'm in all my good senses. So please go and read this again. So it's a very important question we discussed. And if it is classical, go ahead and do a repeat cesarean. Okay, chalo. Ab isme questions kya ke hain? Mm -hmm. uh, PCOs again. No, we'll not talk about PCOs. Classical CS never do trial good. Previous years, trial can be given. Okay. Need PG, PYQ. Yes, it is. I've taken questions from this. Upper segment never retracts. Upper segment, uh, Ramya, uh, contracts. Uh, you know, it. I mean, between uh, contractions, it will relax. Yes. But lower segment does not contract. That's why. That's why it doesn't rupture. That's why a scar in the lower segment does not rupture. Okay. Hmm. Hey, Azar, Kindle Pana Dengda. Okay. <laughs> I hope you're not making fun of me. Can we try ECV? No, with the previous season section, I don't want you to try ECV. Yes, that was one thing which uh, was left in the discussion. If there's a previous CS, don't try ECV. Okay. It's not worth it. Mm, most common side effect of lower abdominal incision. Most common side effect of lower abdominal abdom. See, this incisions which we're talking. The incisions which we are talking, these are uterine incisions. Uterine incisions. We are not talking about abdominal incisions. Abdominal incisions are in the abdomen. They are on the skin of the uh, uh, mother. 
these are uterine incisions, upper segment and lower segment. Okay, abdominal incisions can have infections as the most common side effect. Not uh, hernia, not uh, dehiscence. Mostly, it is the mostly it is the infections and hematoma formations. Castanova, we are coming to that question about amniotic fluid. It is there. The question is there. Yes, yes, good. Um, Sanjay Prakash, yeah, that's the reason. Because the lower segment retracts, that's why the it is actually difficult to reach the lower segment. Whenever we're doing a cesarean, first, uh, you must have seen in so many videos, that first we retract, open the abdomen, and uh, we retract the bladder by opening the UV fold, and then we reach the lower segment. Classical cesarean session is actually easier, but we do lower segments so that next time we can give a trial of normal vaginal delivery. That's the reason why. Okay, let's move on. Question uh, is, uh, primary gravida presented with soft tender abdomen. On examination, fetus is on right occipital posterior presentation. How will you deliver? So, yes. What is the most common presentation? Cephalic. What is the most common presenting part of the head? So, though you know, this is cephalic. All of this is cephalic. Now, head can be flexed. It can be deflexed or it can be extended. So, in a flexed head, you see the vertex presenting part. In an extended head, you see the face presenting part. But in a deflexed head, you see the brow presenting part. So flexed, extended, deflexed. They are the three attitudes of the fetal head. Three attitudes of the fetal head. Based on these three attitudes, you have the presenting parts, which can be vertex, which can be brow, or it can be face. So, what is the most common presenting part? It is vertex. And vertex is always like this. See this? So, this is anterior, this is posterior, and this is the left occipital anterior, or it will be left occipital transverse. Left occipital transverse is more common. Next is left occipital anterior. Now, in the pelvis, if the head is in transverse, see, this is anterior, this is posterior. So, a primary gladder presented with soft end abdomen on examination, the fetus is on right occipital posterior position. So this is right occipital transverse I've drawn. Now, what is right occipital posterior? So, how do you make out the difference? The occiput has the triangular, it has the triangular frontonail. That's the best way to show. So, this is the quadrilateral frontonail, which is the anterior frontonail, and the posterior frontonail is triangular. So, the quadrilateral frontonail is anterior here. So, this is occiput is posterior here. So this is anterior, this is posterior. So this one, this one is right occipital posterior. Now right occipital posterior, all of you should know that a right occipital posterior is the most common malposition. What is the most common presentation? Cephalic. What is the most common attitude? Flexion. What is the most common presenting part? Vertex. And vertex is mostly occipital transverse or occipital anterior. That is the most common. Now, what is the most common malposition? Most common malposition that is occipital posterior. Occipital posterior, 80% of time, it will turn to occipital anterior. 15 to 16% occipital transverse, and I'm so sorry, 15 to 16%. It'll stay occipital posterior. 15 to 16 percent will stay occipital posterior, and two to four percent time, two to four percent it'll be occipital transverse. So yes, occipital posterior becoming occipital anterior is seen in the gynecoid pelvis, and staying occipital posterior is in the anthropoid pelvis, and occipital transverse in the Android pelvis. Okay. So, 
the occipital anterior obviously will deliver occipital posterior will also deliver you know that when the head stays posterior it delivers by face to pubis so occipital posterior in the patient who comes to the labor room you do an examination you do an ultrasound or you do a pv whatever you do and you find out it's occipital posterior don't panic occipital posterior will 80 percent become occipital anterior and it'll deliver normally in 15 to 16 percent it'll stay occipital posterior you know but it'll deliver excuse me it'll deliver that occipital posterior itself which is known as face to pubis if the head is posterior face will be facing the symphysis pubis so that is what is known as face to pubis delivery and around two to four percent times it comes to occipital transfer you can hold the head and rotate it see this one the right occipital transfers you can do manual rotation forceps extraction mrfe manual rotation forceps extraction so yes all these three variations of occipital posterior we are teaching you to tell you that the occipital posterior delivers normally. Normally, occipital posterior will become occipital anterior in the gynecoid pelvis. Delivery will be normal 80%. Few percentage of 15 to 16% will stay occipital posterior. It will also deliver as face to pubis. Anthropoid rotation is not possible. That was your MCQ in the last uh, MCA exam. Uh, last year's MC, MCA exam. Now, occipital posterior becomes occipital transverse. It will not deliver as occipital transfers will not deliver by itself, you'll have to manually rotate, apply forceps, and take out. That variation comes mostly in the exams. Okay, occipital transfers, what do you do? Sometimes occipital transfers is neglected and it becomes deep transverse arrest. Then you have to do a cesarean. So occipital transfers is unlikely that they'll ask you, but occipital posterior becoming occipital anterior and you're trying to do rotation and it is not possible to rotate in anthropoid. It is possible to rotate in gynecoid pelvis. So these are the things which have come in your exam, MCI 2021 June exam. This has come in your exam. All right. So let's not get upset about this. So a primary gyra presents with soft tender abdomen on examination. The, the fetus is in right occipital posterior presentation. Presenting part is uh, vertex and it is in right occipital posterior position. How will you deliver? I will do a normal vaginal delivery. I hope everybody has marked C. Now let me see how many have done C. Okay, many of you done see somebody sends there in section no occipital poster will deliver. Um, C C C C yes C R O P R O P. No, not there in section. Very good. Uh, Chanchal remembers exactly what I had taught. So very good. Mm. Okay, most of you got it right and some of you uh, didn't get it right. So I'm sure that now you got it correct. All right, Chal, let's move on. Uh, next question. The following procedure is being done on a 25-year-old lady in labor. The cord gets torn. What should be the best thing to do? So see, there's one hand on the abdomen and one hand is on the cord and somebody is doing a control cord traction. This goes by the name of Brandt and Andrews. Brandt and Andrews technique. Now, occipital, occipital, uh, so, I'm so sorry. When I say um, placenta delivery by control cord traction, while taking out the placenta, sometimes the cord snaps, cord breaks. If the cord breaks, then it is going to be a placenta inside. So your immediate instinct is you put a hand in the vagina and take out the, I mean, put a hand inside the uterus and take out the placenta. Yes, a lot of us do that also, but that is not correct. It is going to hurt the woman a lot if you put your whole hand inside the uterus. So take her to the OT and under anesthesia, take out the placenta. So it is known as manual removal of the placenta under anesthesia. So yes, I would do a manual removal. So that's the best step here. MRP under general anesthesia, under GA. Do not do it without anesthesia. So answer for this question is this. Now, this placenta, if it doesn't come out, see what are the stages of labor? First stage is of pain. Second stage, the full dilatation happens and the baby comes out. That is second stage. Third stage is delivery of the placenta. And fourth is to observe the woman for one hour after delivery for postpartum hemorrhage. So what are the what is the third stage? Delivery of the placenta. If the placenta has not come out, it's an emergency. And the patient bleeds a lot. Yes, it is a bloody emergency. There's a lot of bleeding going to happen. So in this emergency, do not leave the placenta and think that I'm going to go and have my lunch and come back and remove the placenta later. Anyway, your baby is out, so we can just wait. Please don't do that. 
If the plasma stays back inside, it's an emergency. You must go ahead and do the removal of the placenta. Then only the delivery is complete. So for that, you must take the patient to the OT and give an anesthesia, a mild uh, general anesthesia. You can just hold a mask and uh, knock her out a little bit. And then you will take out the placenta by a manual removal. So please remember, manual removal under GA. Now, sometimes they can be retained bits. Retained bits are different. Retained bits will not present immediately. You think you've done the delivery properly and one small cotyledon of the placenta has stayed back. This gets infected over a few days. It gets infected over a few days and then it starts bleeding. You know, it starts bleeding after four, five days or two, three weeks also sometimes. So retained bits causes secondary PPH. Yes. Secondary PPH is not managed by MRP. Secondary PPH or retained bits, the treatment is a curettage. We do a curettage. So secondary PPH because of retained bits, do a curettage. And if it is a complete placenta which is retained, you do a manual removal of the placenta. All right. So the answer for this is a do a manual removal. Of course, uh, Creed's method is not done. Creed's method is going to cause a lot of pain. Okay, so what all did you all say? Mm. Yeah, most of you said C, MRP. A uh, question, uh, some, some you asking occipital to occipital anterior and anthropoid pelvis. No, it does not happen. Rotation is not possible in the anthropoid pelvis. Some you, please remember that's the question which came last year. Rotation is possible in gynecoid and partial rotation is possible in android, but no rotation is possible in anthropoid. That's the uh, MCQ which came last year. So yes, uh, regarding this question, all of you are correct. CCC, you try and massage. No, you try and massage. Won't pull the placenta out. For that, you have to do manual removal. Under sedation, right? Man removal, best rotation. Yeah, fine. Hmm, that's fine. Yeah, what is the complication of uh, a curatage? Yes, that somebody is already mentioning one step ahead. Treatment is curatage, and the side effect of this curatage could be an Ashman syndrome. That's a good thing you mentioned. Yes, it can cause an Ashman syndrome later. Correct. Hmm. But I'm not saying that, please don't, don't, uh, if you know the complication, doesn't mean that you don't do the procedure. Please don't have that kind of uh, understanding. Yes, the treatment of secondary PPH is curatage and you're going to be good gynecologist and you're going to do it without causing a side effect like Ashman syndrome. If you do it carelessly, if you do a very enthusiastic curatage, you know, you scrape off so much and you hurt the endometrium, that is going to cause a Ashman syndrome. So yes, that is just a complication. Complications are not common, right? Success is common. Complications should not. You should be smart surgeon to understand what complications can happen. So keep that in mind and do a good surgery. That's what general surgeons and gynecologists and ENT surgeons and orthopedicians work with. Okay. You should know the complications so that you avoid them. Um, okay, fine. I think all of you got it correct. Asherman, Asherman. Hmm. If after curatage there is bleeding, um, deep, deep. I mean, if that kind of thing happens, then you'll have to go up, go and open up and see if there is bleeding, which is continuously even after the curatage. Then it is probably some other cause. So then you'll have to open up and see. Can there be an ectopic pregnancy because of a curatage? No, this question was asked to me because I think some guidebook is giving this. Can there be an ectopic pregnancy after retained uh, placenta? Uh, not not really. Maybe they can be an Ashman syndrome because of retained bits. They can be a patient having an uh, endometrium, which is because of manual removal, you can cause some scarring, but not an ectopic pregnancy. No, I, I, I have not heard of this and it's a very vague correlation. Yeah, Modiji, it's going very fast, no? very slow. Yes, because they're asking so many questions. Uh, doesn't matter. So let's go to the next one. 
In a primary graver, in second stage of labor, the fetus is seen at the level of ischial spine, and the there is right occipital transverse. Again, right occipital transverse. There is molding is present. Caput is two plus. She is having good uterine contraction, but there is no descent of the head for the last twenty last two hours. What is the appropriate management in a primary graver in second stage of labor? That means she is fully dilated. That is what is second stage, and the head is at the level of the ischial spines. In right occipital transverse, that means the head is in transverse and is not rotating, and there is some molding which is two plus. What is molding? That the head, the fetal head. See the bones. See these bones. These are having a. These bones are having a space. So that is what is the this space between the bones. The space between the bones. The fetus has the space between the skull bones. So these bones. If they start coming very close, especially the sagittal suture, the main suture of the head, if this comes very close and starts touching to each other, that is what is grade one molding. And if they start overlapping, see now they are overlapping. If they are overlapping, that is grade two. So this is grade one and this is grade two molding. That means the head is big. It is trying to enter the pelvis. See, this is the pelvis, and the head is trying to enter the pelvis, and the bones are molding. See, the bones are coming close, and now they are overlapping. So, when the bones are overlapping, that means the head is big for this pelvis. It is tried to mold itself to get in. So, that is grade two molding. The best kind of, I mean, the best kind of arrangement the baby's head can do is by molding a little and trying to enter the pelvis. Still, the head is not coming down for the last two hours. So, what is the basics which I have told you? That one centimeter should be the dilatation, and one centimeter should be the descent in every one hour in active labor. One centimeter dilatation, one centimeter descent. And if that is not happening, that means there is something wrong with the contraction or something wrong with the pelvis. So this patient not having any descent, there is no progress, and there is great to molding and caput is also very big. There is good swelling on the head. What is the management when there is an occipital transfer? So when it is not moving, go ahead and do a cesarean section. So here the answer is cesarean section, right? So those who marked cesarean section, yes, that's a good answer. Most of you marked that. Obstructed labor, deep transfers are arrest. Yes, correct. That is what is, if it is in transfers we, and it is neglected, we call it a deep transfers arrest. Chalo. What is the absolute contraindication of a cervical cerclage? Now, cerclage, Please remember, cerclage is that procedure which is done for a cervix which is short. How much short? Less than 2.5 centimeters. So if the cervix is short, then I'll have to put a stitch on the cervix so that the baby doesn't come out of the uterus very early in pregnancy. So the cerclage is done here. This is the place where we do the cerclage. And most common cerclage is the, most commonly, it is the McDonald's. McDonald's. McDonald's cerclage is the most common cerclage. Now, when we do the cerclage after 12 weeks, when we do, we, when we remove it, when we remove it just before you plan and delivery, that is 37 weeks. So apply after 12 weeks, remove after 37 weeks or at 37 weeks so that we can deliver normally. Now, what is the most common cerclage is the McDonald's. So why are we doing a cerclage? Because we want the patient to continue the pregnancy as long as possible. Okay, because probably last time she aborted a baby at 20 weeks, 24 weeks. What is the most common cause of second trimester abortions? First trimester abortion is chromosomal. Second trimester is anatomical. What are the common anatomical causes? Septate uterus, biconate uterus, like that. One of them, anatomical causes, is a short cervix. Short cervix, what do you do? This cervix is very short. So what do you do? You put a stitch here. Tie a stitch here. This cervix, you put a stitch. So it doesn't open. So that stage is known as a cerclage. Now, why do you put a cerclage? So that pregnancy doesn't deliver early. But if there is a rupture of membrane, see if this bag is ruptured, if the bag is bulging in the pouch of Douglas, I'm so sorry, bulging in the vagina. Where did that pouch of Douglas came to my head? I'm so sorry. So see, this is the bag which is coming out. It is bulging in the vagina. So even this, I can push the bag inside. I can push the bag inside and I can somehow do a stitch on this. See, it is still intact bag. But if this bag is ruptured, see if this bag is ruptured and the liquor is all coming out, 
then we cannot put a circlage because the bag is ruptured, the fluids are coming out. That also means that the bacteria from the vagina now can enter the uterine cavity and cause infections in pregnancy. Uterine infection in pregnancy is known as chorioamnionitis. Chorioamnionitis. So infections in pregnancy will happen when the leaking has started. So when there is leaking, I cannot do a circlage. Yes, I can do when there's a bag is bulging inside the vagina. I can push it inside because we do a lot of circlages. And I've done many circlages in this position also. But history of ectopic pregnancy, please, circlage is no contraindication. Previous miscarriage is actually an indication. Last time she aborted because the cervix was short. Miscarriage, abortion. Abortion is the uh, obstetrician's term of saying uh, that the baby is lost before 28 weeks. And laymen call it a miscarriage. So don't get confused between miscarriage and abortions. All right. So we say abortions happening in the second trimester are anatomical. And we can put a stitch to prevent that abortion. So yes, C and D are indications. Bag of water in the vagina. Yes, I can try and still do it. But rupture of membranes definitely is a contraindication. All right. So I think I most of you got it correct. Uh, two centimeters short and uh, abdominal circlage can be put in with laparoscopic surgery. Yes, abdominal circlage is madhavan kutti. Yes, we can do circlages through the abdomen also. Sometimes, uh, recently I did a circlage, somewhat which was a very difficult circlage. So when the cervix is so, so short, see, you don't have a cervix. Where will you put a circlage? See, there is no place to put a circlage. So when it is so short, you cannot put a circlage. Then you open the abdomen and then you put a circlage here. Okay, you can do that. Or uh, we can go from the vagina. We can open these parts. Okay, we can open these areas. See, we can open these areas here from the vagina. Okay, Dr. Kutti. Just because you mentioned, I'm telling you how we do. From here, we can open the vagina and then we can go inside and put a stitch like this. So we can do a good vaginal surgery and put a high circlage or we can put an abdominal circlage, which can be with an open procedure or a laparoscopy. So yes, abdominal circlages or high circlages can also be done for patients who have a very, very short cervix or a mutilated cervix, okay? Recently, I did one um, antipartum circlage. We don't we call it before pregnancy, prenatal, not antipartum. We call it prenatal circlage before pregnancy. All right, don't get into all that confusion. Let us get into only the circlages and circlages cannot be done when there's a rupture of membrane. Okay. Uh, Kamlesh, what is Shirodkar? Now, Shirodkar is something like what uh, Dr. Kutti asked me. See, this one is like a Shirodkar. So, I have opened this vagina. See, this vagina was here. See, this vagina was here. So, I opened this vagina. When I opened this vagina, I could go inside, put a stitch. And after putting a stitch, I suture the vagina back because it's a very short cervix. So, in a short and mutilated cervix. Just a minute. Yeah. In a short and mutilated, we can do a Shirodka stitch. Okay, short or mutilated cervix, we can do a Shirodka stitch. Okay, right. Now, oh. Aditya Seni, oh, why will there be a problem? See, the uterus will stretch. I'm just tightening the cervix. I'm not tightening the whole uterus. So this uterus will have enough space to grow. Don't think the baby will not be having space for to grow. The uterus is stretchable a lot. Yes, so uterus will stretch and there'll be enough space for the baby to grow. Don't get uh, worried about that part. Let's move on. Which is the common duration of secondary postpartum hemorrhage? This hemorrhage part is left. I'm so sorry. What is the duration of the secondary postpartum hemorrhage? So yes, we partly discussed it just now that in the first 24 hours, first 24 hours, we have the primary PPH. And after 24 hours, oh, wow, so many answers. Oh, wow, you guys are really, really answering very fast. Oh, God, the deluge of answers. Very good. All of you understand that well. That's good. Okay, good. Everybody, everybody got it correct. So after 24 hours to 
12 weeks, okay? Don't say six weeks. Some books are saying six weeks, so that's what is wrong. 24 hours to 12 weeks is secondary PPH, and that is because of retained bits of placenta we've already discussed. So let's not, uh, we've already discussed this in length. Let's move on and see some other question. The legal requirement for medical termination of pregnancy includes approval of two doctors. Among the following, which time period best suits for this requirement? So they've just twisted a question which you know very well. The answer which you know is that MTP now, MTP after the 2021 amendment can be done up to 24 weeks are completed. But yes, after 20 to 24 weeks, this is the time, this is the answer to this question when two doctors should use their brains. Two doctors should use their brains, all right? Because uh, when I'm doing an abortion, abortion is a very, very, um, you know, it's a, it's a dicey, it's a uh, critical procedure. I feel abortion sounds like a very simple surgery for obstetricians, but abortions are the ones which can cause maximum complications if you just lose your guard. So abortions is something which you people should always understand that they're done free of charge in all the hospitals, all the government hospitals in our country. And if you know somebody who wants an abortion, there'll be so many, so many uh, workers working in your house or some friends or some relatives. Don't look for a cheap um, option in a small clinic somewhere in the bylines of uh, the shady areas of your city. I'm so sorry if I'm saying that because the number of abortions which I say which go septic because of doing a bad abortion, it breaks my heart. Every every intern, I don't know if some of you who are interns are watching this because some PG interns also students must be seeing this. But every intern who's worked in a hospital would have gone to the ICU and would have seen women with septic induced abortions lying there just to die because whatever we do the septic induced abortions will just die you know very high mortality rate more than 10 to 15 percent of these women will die so i don't want abortions to be done by anybody else but gynecologists or people who are trained so that's the requirement a md or a dnb in gynae or a dgo in gynae can do the abortion or a person who is trained in gynae for six months or a person who has done 25 abortions under the supervision of a gynecologist and no other workers no other healthcare setup healthcare system you know the uh, you know the other healthcare systems they have not been approved so far to do abortions so i'm not even going into that discussion abortion should be done under supervision of senior doctors now when abortions are done after 20 weeks the babies are very big it is like causing a mini delivery so like me and my friend, you know, there's a friend who's a gynecologist and I'm thinking, uh, yeah, we have to do this abortion. So I am going to do prostaglandins. And he's going to say, yeah, uh, which prostaglandins are good, but why don't you dilate the cervix a little bit pehle? Why don't you give a laminate tent and let the cervix open up? So when you give the prostaglandins, they lack better. Are, haan, yaar, toh, hai. Let's do that. So both of us decide how to go about it. And both of us are now responsible for this abortion also. So if something goes wrong, then both of our necks are in the news. So what I mean to say is not because we want to share the responsibility. Why do two doctors uh, come together to take the decision? Because we want to take a good decision for the betterment of this patient's abortion. So that easy abortion is done without any complications. So that's why two heads are better than one when abortions are done 20 to 24 weeks. So your answer is correct, but I thought I'll give you information regarding that. So MTPs can be done only by doctors of the uh, of the MBBS kinds. Okay, first of all, those who are gynecologists or those who are trained in gyne. Next question, more about abortion. Okay, you are asking me something about abortions. Uh, can we do abortion without an ultrasound? Kiran Deshmukh, please don't do. Please find out the especially the early. That's uh, Kiran. You you're touching a very raw nerve in me. Any woman who's getting an abortion done, especially the medical abortion, the first seven weeks, which we keep talking, always check whether the baby's in the uterus or not. Because if the baby's in the uterus, your medical drugs will kill the baby and it'll come out. But if it is not in the uterus and if it is in the fallopian tube, if it is here, you will give some drug, like say, which is the next question. You will give some mifepristone, the baby will die. You will give mesoprostol, which will cause contraction. So this endometrium will shed and come out. And there will be some bleeding. You will think abortion ho gaya, everything is over. But actually what happens, only the endometrium is shed and the baby is lying dead inside the fallopian tube. And many times this tube will rupture. 
So always do an abortion after an ultrasound. Now the facilities are there. Every nook and corner, whichever clinic is there, they do have an ultrasound machine. And if there's no ultrasound machine in the hospital, don't go to that hospital. Please go to an hospital, get an ultrasound done, locate the fetus inside the uterus, and then only do an abortion. I would say it is not an absolute necessity, please, but it's a very important requirement because I don't want a woman... Because every day, I work in a big hospital in Delhi, every day in my hospital, every week at least I can say in my hospital, one or two patients will come with a ruptured ectopic. Why? Because they took tablets for doing an abortion without doing an ultrasound. So if it was in the uterus, it would have come out. Those patients don't come to us. But some patients have an ectopic and they have taken these tablets. And when these tablets are taken, these tablets will kill the baby, but the baby is in the tube. And that you can even rupture because of that fetus all right so be very careful so that's a raw nerve you touched but good you touch that nerve mm -hmm. yeah sharuk you explained exactly what uh, dr deshmukh was saying uh, is it not 33 weeks no yeah rachna rajpara no 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 viability is 28 weeks what do you mean by viability that after 28 weeks we can save a baby in our country so when we can save a baby after 28 weeks, you cannot cause an, cannot do an abortion then, isn't it? So simple. If a baby can survive after 28 weeks, you don't have any right to kill it. Before 24 weeks, babies in a country won't survive. Babies in a country will not survive if they're born before 24 weeks. So yes, then if a woman born, she can get an abortion done. So before 24 weeks, we can do an abortion. And after 28 weeks, the babies are viable. Yes, there's a gray area between 24 to 28 weeks which has not been addressed by our uh, healthcare setup so let's not get into that controversy right now before 24 weeks you can do an abortion and after 28 weeks the babies can live so you cannot cause an abortion so it is not 33 weeks mm. new rule of 33 weeks what is that harish mera what is that new rule i'm so sorry I'm ignorant. I'm, I'm speaking on national forum where so many hundreds of you are listening. I'm not aware, doctor. 33 weeks abortion? No, there's nothing like that. Look, you can do an abortion after 24 weeks if required. If the baby's anomalous, suppose only after 26, 27 weeks, one woman comes to me from a village. She never had an ultrasound and the baby's anencephaly and the baby's alive. Baby is having a large abdominal, uh, you know, omphalocele, having malnutrition of gut, and there's a uh, diaphragmatic hernia, and there are uh, septums, uh, I mean, there are ventricular septal defects. So when these kind of anomalies, gross anomalies, which are not, the baby is definitely going to die after birth. So that kind of baby is diagnosed, suppose, at 27 weeks. So I can apply to the local board, you know, the state boards. So the state board will give me permission after constituting, after consulting with the body, which has as a pediatric surgeon, a neurosurgeon, a gynecologist, and a social activist. So these people constitute a board and that board will approve. Yes, we know that this is not a viable baby. The baby, even if it is 27 weeks and has got a encephaly, will not make it. So there's no point continuing the pregnancy till term. So that is after 24 weeks and but before 28 weeks. So this 33 thing, uh, you'll have to tell me what have what reference you're trying to give me about this 33 weeks. If there is contraceptive failure, it's an indication till 24 weeks, not 20 weeks business. See, abortion is for the same indications which were there earlier that the mother is at risk. If she's pregnant and she's got a Eisenmenger syndrome, she'll die. So abort her. If there's a, um, a baby who's at risk, like baby has an encephaly, do an abortion. If the woman gets raped and has a pregnancy, do an abortion. Or if there's a contraceptive failure, patient comes and says, sir, we were using OCPs, but we conceived. Contraceptive failure, do an abortion. These are all the indications of abortion. Till when can you do abortion? Till 24 weeks. There's no such rule that would say that with the contraceptive failure, you can do only till 20 weeks. There's no such rule. Okay. So it's all till 24 weeks. What kind of books are you reading, guys? You're getting uh, very simple, uh, outright basics confused. So please don't read too many books. I hope you're not reading online references by, you know, WHO and the American College and the Royal College and the uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, Australian New Zealand Journal of Obstetrics and Gynae and South African Journal. Please, guys, I hope you're not doing all of that. Please, internet should be the source for the last minute things which you don't understand and you've not had time to read. 
So if you want to see an image, you want to see something about an abruption, you put abruption, Google abruption image and see abruption how it looks or uh, plus an accreta how it looks, you know, something you, you not read and you want a quick reference. So something better than nothing. Don't read by habit by all these recommendations. MCI students, please pass your exam by reading the notes given to you by your teachers. As simple as that. If you have doubts, please refer to Holland and Bruce Obstetrics and Shaw's Gynecology. That's the end of this. And if you're having a lot of time to read, then come back to Preplado Forum on the YouTube, which is free of charge. See the MCQs given by Dr. Prasan Vich. There'll be something like at least 300, 350 MCQs given in various uh, heads of the exams like INICT, NEET and uh, MCI. Do those MCQs. Even after that, if you have time, read another subject. Don't just read, keep reading gynecology from so many sources. Please, guys, do not waste your time by reading guidelines. Guidelines come only for postgraduates and for consultants. And when we read those guidelines, we will tell you. Whatever is changing, we will tell you, man. What is routine, you should know. In abortion, what has happened is enough. More than that, don't read into the, you know, the things which are discussed in media in this 33 weeks. You have to tell me what, really, now I'm getting a little worried. What, what is this 33 weeks bit? So tell me what is the reference of that, okay? Okay, both jada baat ho gaya uske baare mein. So, till panicking and OCT pills, and we should do session of aggression and DNC. Okay, Azar, that's a good question. Azar, we can do the pills, you know, the medical abortion. This is a medical abortion. Where is that? Yeah. So, medical abortion can be done till seven weeks or till nine weeks. Seven weeks is ninety nine percent success, and nine weeks is ninety five percent success. And uh, dilatation and curettage can be done till twelve weeks. Suction evacuation till ten weeks. You can do till twelve weeks also, but ideally twelve weeks, eight to ten weeks. Eight to ten weeks is the suction evacuation. DNC up to twelve weeks, and. After 12 weeks, after 12 weeks, you call it the dilatation and evacuation. All right. So this is the outright basics, which you wanted to know. Okay. 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 Now let's see the next question. Um, which of the following drug is used in MTP for a 20 year old female who is in early weeks of pregnancy? So that is the medical abortion, which you asked me. Azar. So what is the answer to this one? Now, come on. I'm not going to answer the question, which is there on the screen. Please answer. I've drawn something here. That is just for the purpose of, uh, you know, we had some discussions about abortion. So I was discussing. So, yes. Uh, what is the answer to this question? Uh, C, C, C. Everybody saying C. Oh, Yuvraj Rai, you've hit the, <laughs> you've hit the nail on its head. Good. Please read the simplest way of reading. I'm a very simple gynecologist. I don't claim that I'm teaching you all the things which are present about Ops and Gyne. I might not know so much also. I'm a very simple, basic gynecologist. I'm nowhere better than any other teacher which you know. But I'm enough for you guys. That's what I keep saying in all my classes also. That please, if I say 100 things and 5% things are wrong and 5% uh, things are too many, at least 90% of what I say is good enough for you guys to pass this exam. So if after 40, if you get 36 marks, that's, I think, more than enough in Ops and Gani, right? So just go ahead and follow this outright basics that follow the outright basic notes. If you have any doubts, refer to Ops and Gani by the two book, uh, famous books, which I told you, and then see the MCQs by your teacher. That's what you should do. Follow one teacher, any one teacher which you like. Okay, it can be me or anybody else, but please don't confuse yourself before the exams. I've always said that. Good. Okay, mm -hmm. so DNC uh, and suction evacuation timings, please. Sir. That's why I told you, uh, Shahrukh, that DNC can be done until 12 weeks. See, dilatation and curettage. What is curettage? You dilate the cervix and you scrape the baby out. Curettage. Now, when the baby is very big, let's say 16 weeks, now you cannot scrape the baby. Baby is big. You know, it's a big form baby. With the curate, you'll only go and scratch him, not do much harm. So then you have to take an instrument, go inside, dilate the cervix, go inside and hold the baby. Grab the baby parts and pull out. Yeah. You know, that's why I don't do, like to do abortions. So yes, I do abortions only of dead babies. Okay. So it's a, it's a, it's a thing which is there. You know, a lot of us gynecologists are not very happy doing abortions. But yes, a lot of people do it. It's a, it's a personal thing. So evacuation requires you to take big instruments, go inside and take out. So after 12 weeks, dilatation, evacuation. Before that, you can say a DNC. All right. 
So that's what is how it's given in your Williams also. Okay. Okay, fine. Okay, uh, let's go into the next question. Answer to this one, I forgot to give, give you the answer. It is, so abortions also be discussed. Very good. Let's go into this image. Identify the image, okay? The image is showing a fetus in a uterus and there is a placenta which is at the interloss. So it is totally covering, see it is totally covering the interloss. So placenta previa, nowadays we don't have placenta previa as a, uh, Type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, like that, that is already gone. We have plasma previa like plasma previa partly covering or totally covering. So this is totally covering. And then we have the partly covering. That is called placenta previa. Then we also have a low lying. Low lying is when the placenta is within, within. Two centimeters of internal os. So it is not covering, but it is within two centimeters of internal os. That is what is known as a low lying placenta, or it is placenta previa partly covering or totally covering. So please, placenta previa bleeding, placenta previa bleeding, don't do a per vaginal examination. Placenta previa bleeding, don't do a per vaginal examination, number one. And placenta previa bleeding, and the patient comes to a term 37 and more do a cesarean section. So this is the easiest question which comes bleeding, placenta previa, cesarean section, especially when it comes to term. But if before 34 weeks bleeding, placenta previa. Now this question is unlikely to come to you guys, but I always teach you this. If before 34 weeks, placenta previa is bleeding, then that is managed by the McAfee Johnson regime. What is that? Conservative management. Give rest, give sedation, of course, arrange for blood, give IV fluids, keep it in a high risk ward. But if it is before 34 weeks and plus and previous bleeding, McAfee Johnson, conservative management, is successful in 90% of patients. It has got a success, it's got a success of 98, 90% rather. It's got a success of 90%. So yes, McAfee Johnson can be done for placenta previa bleeding before 34 weeks. After 37 weeks, if the placenta previa is bleeding, then we are not worried. If there is bleeding, go ahead and do a serious section. Of course, you must do it fast because if the patient is bleeding, she can get into shock very easily. All right, be careful of that. So yes, uh, in, so in inspection ward, 90% got to stop. What about in Krita, Krita, per Krita? Uh, Iqbal, see if there is uh, a Krita in Krita per Krita and there is bleeding. So most of the times, of course, immediately you, uh, after delivery of a baby, you want to remove the placenta. So you do the control cord traction. Placenta, the cord snaps and the placenta inside. I told you, take the patient to the OT and do a manual removal of the placenta under general anesthesia. Of course, you give a mild inhalation anesthesia and you'll quickly take it out. Sometimes, when you're trying to do the manual removal of placenta, the placenta is badly stuck to the uterus. That becomes a creta. Or it is going into the muscle, in creta. Going to the serosa, a creta. If these kind of patients are there and placenta, a creta, in creta, per creta, any of this is bleeding too much, you'll have to open the abdomen and try and remove the placenta and stop the bleeding. Most of the times, an experienced obstetrician can manage to save the uterus. But many, many times, many, many times, a creta in creta per creta. The bleeding doesn't stop. You end up in a hysterectomy. So that's what happens. A creta in creta per creta. You should be able to diagnose if there is bleeding happening too much and you're not able to remove the placenta and the patient is going to die. She's going to get exsanguinated and she's going to die because of bleeding. Immediately think in terms of opening the abdomen in the OT and see what is happening. And if you think it is a creta in creta per creta, please, most of the time, it may end up in a hysterectomy for this patient because the placenta doesn't come out and it keeps bleeding profusely. All right, you should be a fast surgeon. You should be an experienced surgeon to manage that. Okay, so let's move on. 
identify this image yes guys now uh, this image uh, yeah i'm not saying the answer now please look at this what is the lesion which is there in the lower part of the woman's body and we've given a magnified view also of that okay try to concentrate on this part uh, there's a part here which i want you to concentrate on this part you try to concentrate yes uh, Hmm. Everybody got it correct. People who are answering, of course, have got it correct. All right, good. Yes, this is a vesicovaginal fistula. And vesicovaginal fistula basically is a complication of obstructed labor. Okay, it's a complication of obstructed labor. Look here. The head is here. And this is the vagina. This is the bladder in front. So this head, this head in obstructed labor will press on the bladder neck against the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis is here. So when the head, when this head presses against the bladder neck, this head pressing against the bladder neck causes ischemia. So yes, this after delivery, the uterus will contract. This is the vagina and this is the bladder here like this. Now what happens? This area gets ischemic. This area gets ischemic and it sloughs off. And then the urine from this will come out like this. So this is what is shown here. This is what is shown here. That is a vesicovaginal fistula. So when does the vesicovaginal fistula present to you? So most common, most common cause is the obstructed labor. Obstructed labor. Okay, and it presents. When does it present to you? Obstructed labor has happened, and the head is compressed. The bladder against the pubic symphysis. Ischemia has happened. So it presents. It presents at five to seven days. Five to seven after five to seven days of the delivery. Yes. How do you deliver an obstructed labor? Obstructed labor delivery is by cesarean section only. Don't try any stunts. Obstructed labor. If you diagnosed. Go ahead and do a cesarean section. But after obstructed labor, please remember the cut the ends, the area which we compress, the vagina, the bladder, which we compress against the pubic symphysis, they will get ischemic and they will slough off. So when they slough off, you must do a you must uh, try to prevent this. So when do they present? Let's complete the answer first. When do they present? Vesicovaginal fistula, most commonly obstructed labor. When do they present? They present after five to seven days of the delivery. And how is the delivery done? It is done by cesarean section. Now, how can you avoid this? If you diagnose that there's an obstructed labor, then you can put a catheter. Yes, you can put a catheter inside the bladder and give rest to the bladder. Okay, don't let it increase in size four or five times in a day and then the woman goes to urinate. So every time it increases in size, it'll stretch over this ischemic areas so it presents because of obstructed labor it presents on five to seven days after the obstructed labor is managed by a cesarean you can avoid it by putting a catheter and catheterize for at least 14 days to 21 days give rest to the bladder let this ischemic area start getting some blood supply so two weeks to three weeks you do the catheterization to prevent this but mostly Obstructed labors happen in villages and uh, these things are neglected and the patient may come to you with a vesicovaginal fistula on the 5th to the 7th day. So when should you repair it? That's what is important. Repair the VVF. Repair the VVF. Excuse me. Repair the VVF only after 3 months. Let these cut ends get some amount of healing. These cut ends. These cut ends. This the cut ends which uh, shedded off because of the ischemia. Let these cut ends get some healing. Once the healing is done, then only you should do the repair of this vesicovaginal fistula. Three months. Three months. I did not say six weeks. Okay. I'm saying three months. Okay. These are the principles of healing. You want this scar to get uh, heal, healing. You want these cut ends to heal by the secondary intention and then only you want to put the sutures so wait for three months not six weeks all right so let's move on uh oh yeah what is the most common uh 
um, cause it is obstructed labor what is the most common site the most common site of a vesico vaginal fistula is the mid vaginal okay the mid vaginal vvf mid vaginal vvf is the most common site of the fistula so what are the tests which can localize the fistula? You know the three swab test, but better than the three swab test is the cystoscopy. So best test to localize, you know, the best test to localize the fistula is not the three swab test. It is the cystoscopy. That is put a scope into the bladder and locate the site of the fistula. Okay. Three swab test is good, but the best is cystoscopy. Chalo. Um, good. Uh, six weeks. Kya likha hai? No, it's not six weeks, Prince Davis. That's what I said. Thank you, Riza Khan. Uh, you're getting a lot of uh, information. Three months I'm liking. The six weeks is given to... Uh, you know, I've, I've seen that... Uh, Suprapubic catheterization. No, you can put a... Uh, you can put a uh, catheter into the bladder. Yes, if it is a very big... Uh, if it is a very big uh, fistula, then you can't do anything with the suprapubic catheterization also. The urine will keep coming into the blood, isn't it? And keep coming out of the vagina. So yes, a, vagina, a normal urethral catheter is enough. Okay. Ah, all right. Chalo. Let's see the next question. Now, a patient with breast cancer, she's on treatment with tamoxifen. Yeah, see that question which I was discussing with you. Patient with a breast cancer is on treatment with tamoxifen and she now presents with complaints of bleeding per vaginum. What is the most likely cause? Yes. Now, I'm not going to say because I've already given you a hint about this question. All right. Yeah, most of you got it correct. Okay. Prabhakar and Naya Ken and Dr. Dikav and Cha and Devani and everybody, I'm sure. So, yes, what happens? That tamoxifen is given for the purpose of the anti estrogenic action. And that anti estrogenic action is good for the um, uh, sea breast not to recur. But yes, the same tamoxifen is estrogenic on the endometrium. So, these are the SERMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators. So, SERMs, some of them are estrogenic on the body and some of them have anti estrogenic action. So, some places in the body, they are anti -sonic. So, like tamoxifen is anti on the breast. So, we use it for the follow-up of CA breast. So, that CA breast does not occur, does not recur. But it has got an estrogenic action on the endometrium. So, that can cause hyperproliferation of the endometrium and endometrial cancers. So, many patients with the estrogen receptor positive, when we give them tamoxifen, we give them the option. We give them the option of getting a hysterectomy done at the same time as a mastectomy also done. So, yes, that is also part of the management of CA breast. Uh, or a lot of people don't get a hysterectomy done. They get a, just a oophorectomy done. So that when the oophorectomy is done, then the estrogenic um, uh, environment is much lesser. So that also can be done. All right. So the answer is endomal cancer. I'm happy with your answers, all of you. Good. Uh, used in CA breast. Okay, fine. That's a simple one. We've discussed about this earlier. Which of the following is an absolute contraindication to IUCD insertion? Now, this is the answer. Come on. Let's see. I want to go this question. Absolute contraindication to intrauterine device insertions. Let's see. A, A, A. A lot of A. This one B. Another B. Another B. Oh, wow. Right. I'm so happy that all of you are saying unexplained vaginal bleeding. Very good answer because when a patient is having IUCD, the most common side effect of an IUCD, most common side effect of an IUCD is bleeding. So when a patient has unexplained bleeding, that's the last thing you should be doing. Okay, please. Unexplained vaginal bleeding, do not give an IUCD. Now, a previous PID is not a contraindication. A current PID is a active PID. Current or we can say an active PID, that is definitely is a contraindication, I agree. Is a contraindication, I agree with that. But not a previous PID. Now, previous ectopic pregnancy, this is what a lot of you keep saying. 
is a contraindication. It is not a contraindication. Do not worry about this. And HIV positive is also not a contraindication. Yes, HIV positive with AIDS, with full-blown AIDS, any infections, super added infections are there and patient is very sick. Then it is contraindication for anything in life. I mean, that patient will be in the you know hospital, will be very sick. And that AIDS patient in active AIDS, full-blown AIDS, won't be thinking much of sexual intercourse in the first place. So that's a very sick patient. So HIV positive state is not a contraindication and so is not previous ectopic. Now this previous ectopic has been blown to bits by so many people and they keep telling you that previous ectopic is a contraindication to ICD. So now let me show you some proofs. Okay. So this is what is the medical eligibility criteria. Medical eligibility criteria of any contraception, suppose you're using combined pills or IUCDs or using, uh, you know, condoms or using any other method like an implant, all these methods have a medical eligibility criteria, MEC 1, 2, 3 and 4. So please read this. I've given you this good screen time and you can always see this on YouTube again. Please remember, MEC 1 and MEC 2, we can give the, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the contraceptive method. And three and four, usually we don't give. So suppose they ask you, what is the medical eligibility criteria of IUCD when a woman is bleeding, abnormal uterine bleeding? It is MEC4. It is a contraindication. That's how we say. What is the medical eligibility criteria when a woman is having a previous ectopic? It is MEC1. It is safe. Go ahead and give. There's no contraindication. Ectopic pregnancy does not increase with IUCD. I've told you this so many times. When a patient is having a IUCD, it reduces pregnancy. Obviously, it reduces ectopics also. Do not say IUCD causes ectopics. Please, if IUCD causes ectopic, then why would I give an IUCD to anybody? Just tell me that I put an IUCD in a woman and then she says, sir, any problems with this IUCD? Yeah, you're going to have an ectopic pregnancy. It's going to rupture and you're going to die. So, Am I going to say that for a woman who's going to have an IUCD, that she's going to have an ectopic? Who will take an IUCD with me if she's going to have an ectopic? Please, guys, this is really crazy. IUCDs do not cause pregnancies. That's why they cause even lesser ectopics. Okay, if at all she conceives with an IUCD in use, slightly more chance of an ectopic. Rule out an ectopic, we say. So the punchline is, if a woman is pregnant, when she's having an IUCD in situ, just rule out an ectopic pregnancy. That's all. It does not increase the ectopics. Please, for God's sakes, don't understand that. So now, coming to my question, is a previous ectopic a contraindication to an IUCD usage? Absolutely not. It is not. It's a MEC1. Go ahead and give. So I'll show you more proof. This is from the uh, books which are telling us about uh, the uh, eligibility criteria of all uh, major drugs, major methods of contraception. So now see. PID, past PID, assuming no current risk factors. So past, okay, different color. Past PID is MEC1 for initiation. I for initiation or for contraception. C for continuation, continuation of a method. So, Initiation or continuation of a method. So when a person has a previous PID, it is not a contraindication. It's MEC1. For continuity, it is MEC1. So you can initiate and you can continue. Now, high risk of HIV. Risk of HIV. So it is MEC1 or MEC2. See, it is not a contraindication. Okay. Severe or advanced HIV clinical disease. So yes. MEC3, I'd said if she's got uh, advanced HIV and she's got AIDS and she's got, uh, you know, she's in full-blown AIDS, obviously it's a contraindication for anything. So yes, that's fine. Now let us see the one which you want to hear. If she's had past ectopic pregnancy to initiate, it is MEC1, no contraindication. To continue, it is MEC1, no contraindication. This is uh, a book which is known as the uh, the uh, AOGD bulletins. You can go ahead and see it online. It's a very interesting, you know, very interesting source of information and it is written by doctors from Ames and uh, that's the most uh, coveted institute of a country and INSCT exams 
and uh, if these are the doctors who are writing the uh, uh, you know these guidelines they are known as the uh, AOGD bulletins you can put it on the internet and you can see this all of these are guidelines and you can see one of these years there was this chapter on contraception so this full book on contraception is there and these are the guidelines from the doctors who are uh, teaching the best in the country and it is there for you please go ahead and see it is from those books and I'm not claiming that this is my own source. This is from the people who really matter. So go ahead and see this. And past ectopic pregnancy is not a contraindication at all. Okay? Shall I see the next question? Oh, yeah. Let me see what you guys had to respond on this. Uh, slightly more chance of ectopic. Yeah, that's all. Mm. Okay, good. Most of you got it correct and I'm happy. All right, let's see next question. Maximum amniotic fluid is at what gestational age? So everybody's saying BBBA also somebody's saying. And BBB, BBB, BBB. Okay, fine. So amniotic fluid, if you see, the amniotic fluid has a graph like this. And at term, at 40 weeks, it is not actually increasing at that time. It is now reducing. So it is highest around 32 to 34 weeks, which is around 1000 ml. And then around 36 weeks, it comes down a little, comes to 800 ml. And then at 40 weeks, it comes down to around 600 ml. So, when the Lyca is maximum around 1000, after that, it is coming down. So, 36 weeks is the time when the Lyca is reducing and the size of baby is increasing. That's the time when we can do something called the external cephalic versions. What do you mean by versions? If it's a breach or a transverse lie, you can turn the baby and make him cephalic so external cephalic version you can do it only at 36 weeks why after 36 or 37 weeks also you can do why because the liquor is reducing and the baby is now a little bigger now we cannot do ecv here if you do the ecv here it will fail because the liquor is now increasing and the baby is still very small so that's why that's why the logic of this external cephalic version is used to explain you the amount of amniotic fluid. I know some books are saying that it is like it is highest at 40 weeks and that's why this confusion. Please remember this logic of external cephalic version. We can do external cephalic version only when the like is reducing and the baby is bigger in size. So that what, that's what happens at 36 weeks. The like it is now beginning to reduce in amount and the baby is slightly bigger. I can do external cephalic version. That's why we know that the like is reducing at 36 weeks. That's why at 36 weeks, you can do external cephalic version. So don't say like it is maximum at 36 weeks. Actually at 36 and 40 weeks, it is reducing. The peak is at 32 to 34 weeks. So yes, in your exam, they asked you one of these. And if they ask you one in MCI, December 21 exam, they wanted to ask you this and they gave you the choice only of 32 they do not give you the choice of 34 so choices were 28 32 36 40 so that's why we answered at 32 so yes uh, most of you got it correct uh, mm, yeah that's right correct let's see the next question cardiac output comes to normal after how many days of delivery yeah when does it come back to normal so yes, when is it maximum? When does it come back to normal? Now this is the question, new question which is coming in exams. So when we talk about cardiac output, cardiac output is maximum in antenatal time. In antenatal time at 32 weeks, 30 to 32 weeks. And first 24 hours, it is again high it is increased by 70 percent here it is increased by 50 percent so around 30 to 32 weeks it is increased by 50 percent and first 24 hours after delivery it is increased by 70 percent so the question asked is when is it maximum in pregnancy 30 32 weeks when is it maximum overall pregnancy delivery and postnatal Immediate postnatal first 24 hours, it is even more than pregnancy. It is as high as 70%. Okay. So 
cardiac output increases that is what i've told you so that's the picture so you see around 28 to 32 weeks it is 7.1 liters per minute and second stage of labor it is going to 8.9 liters and immediately postpartum the first 24 hours it is even higher so it is in pregnancy and delivery and postnatal all these timings put together it is maximum in the first 24 hours during the pregnancy it is maximum around 30 weeks okay which i've told you fine so when does the cardiac output comes back to normal so cardiac output and the and the patient's heart rate both of these increase in pregnancy and they come back to normal at yes what are your answers what did you write let me see yeah most of you wrote c some of you wrote d there's some b also all right so yes there are a lot of controversies in this answer please the you don't have to read any books when i'm already giving the answers it comes back to normal at 10 days so cardiac output and heart rate it comes back to normal in 10 days after delivery so they might also give you 45 days yes that the pure parium 42 days is pure parium so 42 45 one of these choices may come so they comes back to normal in 10 days all right so blood volume non-pregnant level by one week cardiac output declines to not pregnant level by 10 days and heart rate and blood pressure follow the same pattern so heart rate blood pressure cardiac output all these three heart rate blood pressure and cardiac output all of these three come back to normal by 10 days after delivery blood volume comes back to normal by one week that's the slightly different information which i gave you blood volume reduces by come back to normal pre-pregnant levels by one week hypertensive drug of choice in pregnancy yes what is the hypertensive drug of choice in pregnancy now this is the question which came in your exam and that's why i kept it just the way december 21 and they have not even mentioned the drug which you're looking choice e yes you'll oh god it's gone so whatever you wanted me to say it's gone i'm so sorry for being a nerd here so yes choice e is what you're looking for and you're looking for labetalol so yes all of you know the drug of choice is actually labetalol but i think sometimes the old question bank is used for the exams and I'm seriously surprised that lepidolol was not even a choice. So yes, when that question came, all of you answered methyl dopa. Please don't answer hydrolyzine and uh, uh, you know beta blockers definitely are contraindicated. Lisinopril is AC inhibitors. It is a contraindicated drug. So don't get confused. Hydrolyzine was a drug of choice many years back. After that, methyl dopa has been the drug of choice. Then there's no doubt about that. So methyl dopa was the drug of choice before lepidolol. So the previous drug of choice and the answer to this question, because there was no labetalol in the question, so choices. So, but now the drug of choice is labetalol, whether it is gestational hypertension, which is after 20 weeks, or it is pre-existing. So we don't call it uh, pre-existing, we call it chronic hypertension, I'm sorry. Chronic hypertension. Both the hypertension, the drug of choice, Whichever hypertension the patient presents with is labetalol. So what did you guys say about this? Uh... Labetalol, methyl dopa, labetalol, methyl dopa. A lot of chit chat within amongst you guys. Okay. Right. So if you got it, methyl dopa, it's fine. Yeah, my favorite drug. Thanks, Harish Nera. Thanks for saying that. My favorite drug. Okay, which of the following conditions require serial determination of a pregnancy test? Serial means you go on doing the pregnancy test. So yes, uh, RH incompatibility, you don't want to do it. There you do a serial titer of the, of the antibodies if the patient is having the indirect Coombs test positive. So RH incompatibility, you do indirect Coombs test if positive. If the mother is making antibodies, then you do titer of antibodies. That is done serially. So the antibody titan RH isomerization is done serially. In molar pregnancy, yes, in molar pregnancy, we do a serial 
estimation because i want you know what do we do what is the management of a molar pregnancy please first of all how does it look like on an ultrasound hot shot question snowstorm appearance please i know you know that very well but it is coming in the exams so snowstorm appearance for the uh, ultrasound picture now molar pregnancy the hcg should reduce to normal so nine weeks it comes back to normal in a complete mole and seven weeks it comes back to normal in a partial mole so molar pregnancy the hcg comes back to normal complete mole it comes back to normal in nine weeks some of your books are saying eight weeks and six weeks that is long back ancient information please remember nine weeks and seven weeks okay now serially you should do it every week we do it suppose the hcg was ten thousand next week should come back come down let's say 5000 then it comes up to 500 then it comes down to 200 comes down to 50 like that it goes on reducing so once it reduces that's why you've been looking at it serially how long you woman uh, you want this woman to be followed up yes one year if not one year at least six months you want to follow the hcg and the hcg should not rise once you do the molar evacuation nine weeks it should come back to normal and then for six months it should stay normal it should stay less than five and after that, you can give her a chance of getting pregnant. So six months, at least one year ideal, six months at least you should follow up the molar pregnancy and no pregnancy during this time. No pregnancy during this time. So yes, what is the contraception? Contraception into six months we give and the contraception is combined all contraceptive pill and don't give IUCD. Don't give IUCD. COCP is the method of choice. Okay. Yeah, suction evacuation. Somebody is saying, Allu Arjun, please don't do sharp curatage. After one week, you can do a curatage to check. So, suppose a woman comes with a complete mole. My method of choice, any size, whether it's 14 weeks, 24 weeks, 30 weeks, whatever size they give you to scare you, always say the answer is suction evacuation and don't say sharp curatage. You know, there's a controversy on that. But yes, after one week, I can do a check curatage. Because check retouch should be done to rule out any retained bits, retained molar tissue. Retained molar tissue is basically the since cytotrophoblast and cytotrophoblast. And since cytotrophoblast can persist and cause choriocarcinoma, the cytotrophoblast can persist and cause placental cytotrophoblastic tumor. So you don't want anything to stay back. So after the evacuation, one week later, you can do a check retouch. All right. Cost evasion for CIN3 and carcinoma of the cervix is. All of you know, most common cost of agent is HPV-16 and most malignant. Yes, give me the answer. I'm not writing that. Let's see what are you guys saying. Yes, most malignant is 18. Okay, so most common is 16, most malignant is 18. And you know that the vaccine is used. Uh, against the most common uh, nine serotypes. Nowadays, we have the Gardasil, Gardasil 9, which is against the nine serotypes, which are, yes, let me attempt, you know, I keep forgetting myself because it's no great shakes to remember these, these nine serotypes against which it is working. I'm not very happy with this vaccine. Yes, something better than nothing. That principle, this vaccine should be used. It is not a sure shot uh, uh, prevention of the cervix. So it is again 6, 11, 16, 18, and then 33, 45, 52, 58. I, did I get it correct? I keep forgetting. I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not good at remembering this at all. I must have missed it in so many classes also. Maybe it is correct. Okay. Uh, 31, 33. Okay, yes, Dr. Mohan Kumar got it right. Okay, Mohan, you're right. Okay, so uh, when we talk about this, then remember one thing. Uh, we will always have, basically, if a person is having a clean sex life, then she is very unlikely to get CA cervix. If the husband and the wife or the, you know, live-in partners, whatever we say, they're going to have a, oh, I think I, th I, I wrote only 31 to likhai Yeah. See, I told you, I keep forgetting. 
So, so I'm, I'm I'm not an expert on this vaccine at all. I hate this vaccine actually, but uh, now I'm seeing it online. I'm going to get into trouble. So what happens that when a person is exposed to too much of uh, HPV because of multiple partners, there's a chance of serious cervix. So we say before sex starts, then you can take the CA cervix vaccine, which is Gardasil. It prevents CA cervix in 90% by these. Okay, let me write it and tell you. CA cervix reduced by 90% if given before exposure and by 40% if given after exposure. Exposure means sex with a person who's got HPV positive. So 90% prevention and 40% prevention against these nine serotypes only. Now that's what you have to understand. It prevents against only these nine serotypes. It's not going to prevent CA cervix because CA cervix is going to happen by 50 serotypes at least. So if you give a vaccine which is working only against nine, these are the common nine ones, the high risk ones. So against this, this cardiacal vaccine will prevent. So don't come and ask me that, sir, if this person has taken a vaccine, then she's prevented of CSR. Against these nine serotypes, CSR won't happen. That too, if it is given before she's had sex with an infected person. Against these nine, remaining 40 odd, the chance of CSR still stays. So you know what is written in the books? You give the vaccine. How many you give? You give three. Zero day. Two months and six months. You give the three shots and you prevent her against these nine, but you continue the pap smear and the screening for CA service. You don't stop the screening. The screening continues. Now, that's what you have to understand that all these vaccines are not a sure shot prevention. So, what do they say? If you have a lot of money and you can prevent uh, CA service by these nine serotypes by taking these. Common serotypes which cause CA cervix, you'll have prevention. But the other 40 odd will still say. So one thing which I like in all of this is that the SAGE guidelines, okay? The strategic advisory group of uh, experts on, um, uh, on vaccination. The SAGE guidelines say that give at least one vaccine to all girls between 9 to 14 years. That part I like a lot because some prevention is better than nothing. So 9 to 14, you give at least one dose. There is some prevention. At least will reduce the burden of CA service. That part I like. Apart from that, I'm not a very big proponent. See, I keep forgetting the serotypes also. I, I teach in how many classes and every time I keep forgetting this. So that's what you, it shows you how much I like this. Okay, let's move on. And yes, it should be given to all the girls between, yes, 9 to 45. All the women should be given, yes, three doses. But who's giving them the virus? The men. So actually, the men also should be given. So imagine all men and all women in the world should have the CA cervix vaccine. So that's the idea which these companies have, that everybody should get the CA cervix vaccine. And imagine the money which is involved. But it is preventing only against these nine serotypes. Please, that's the punchline. Okay. So don't think it's going to give total protection. If a person is sexually active with many people, then screening is the only uh, way you can prevent CA cervix in that person. Then the vaccine is not going to help. Okay. Let's move on. A patient underwent radiotherapy for CA cervix. Which organ in the pelvis is most radiosensitive? So remember, the ovary is the most radiosensitive pelvic organ. But ovarian cancer is the most radio resistant also. So CA ovary, CA ovary radiotherapy is, I tend to write this line a lot, useless. We don't use it at all. We use it probably only for metastatic disease to the bones, like the brain or the, I mean, to the skull or to the spine, we use some radiotherapy. But primary treatment of CA ovary, radiotherapy is useless. So only radio sensitive, yes, only radio sensitive ovarian, ovarian tumor is dysgerminoma. Only radio sensitive ovarian tumor is the dysgerminoma. All right. So, yes, all of you got it correct. Uh, somebody wants me to teach intersex now. See, a lot of people uh, are saying this is getting too long. 
intersex is a three hour topic guys i can take a session whenever you want on intersex it's my favorite topic you know that okay most of you got it correct all right utkarsh raj intersex uh, if you have the app then go ahead and see the app because intersex is a very uh, it's a, it's a long topic but yes you will understand it if you give a good patient hearing because you've gone from basics to the diseases so i'm sure you will understand if you see the app terms okay let's move on oh now is the time to say thank you so uh, all right thank you but if you Subscribe have any doubt press you the can bell icon ask. Now, so I'm, you I'm never miss I'm an here. update in from prep ladder so uh, i don't think subscribe and press that i'm going to be able to send you this please see the recording if you want to see the uh, you know the uh, the pdf go ahead and see the recordings let me see if you have any questions so adenomyosis and fibroids see adenomyosis and fibroids somebody was asking me so if you see the adenomyosis and the fibroids fibroids are well circumscribed growth okay so you will have a capsule around the fibroids and the muscles will be seen separately nicely you can see the see the muscles like that now what is adenomyosis a uterus which increases in size see this uterus has increased in size there's a lot of myo hypertrophy so this is adenomyosis so what are you seeing here you're seeing nothing i mean you're seeing just a big uterus fibroid is got a pseudo capsule it's got a capsule and you can see fibroid tissue separate from the uterine muscle adenomyosis is just a uniformly large uterus so you'll not see that in adenomyosis you will not see the enlarged uterus separate from the normal muscle you will not be able to make out in fact there is a loss of distinction between the endometrium and the myometrium that distinction also lost so the size of the uterus please a lot of you in the revision classes where i went all of you muddle this one up and i those who are listening here know what i'm saying and others who were not in any revision class remember size is always less than or equal to 14 cm or they will write 14 week size pregnancy size also so 14 cm or 14 week will be written in your exams a uterus is never bigger than 14 weeks in a case of adenomyosis adenomyosis mostly presents with pain abdomen and heavy periods in a woman who is multiparous pain abdomen heavy periods multiparous endometriosis pain abdomen but in a younger woman who is infertile pain young woman infertile is endometriosis all right that's the difference between endometriosis and adenomyosis adenomyosis only good treatment yes you can give relief with drugs but the best treatment of adenomyosis is to go ahead and do a hysterectomy because the woman is mostly a multiparous woman all right so sure. good now there was something else i thought you can remind me uh sir are you on telegram i am on telegram but then i see i am on whatsapp also i am on facebook also but then uh, my life doesn't give me the time i i only visit the preplad forum for the questions and if you have if there's a telegram uh, forum made by preplad i'll be the happiest to because uh, some things i'm uh, you know uh, i'm 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 bound by a Uh, by a clause that I should be able to teach you online only on the forums like this, and of course, if you have a Telegram forum which is moderated by Preplad, I'll be the happiest to discuss with you on uh, Telegram also. So, Anubhav, if you listen to this, uh, please make uh, this uh, thing clear to the students that if I can uh, talk to them on Telegram, okay. Mm. so there's no controversy dr imran ortho if we are if we are asking you best screening method for ca service it is pap smear cost effective yes if i have told you pap smear i'm changing my answer because yes shaws also is saying that the cost effective method of screening for pap smear cost effective is via so if shaw says that i have to i have to say that answer to you i have to believe that answer okay so yes cost effective method is via because uh, shaws and even uh, the psm book is saying that but the best method of screening no doubt is by a pap smear okay fine that is done um in plasma prev call for help and that is so uh, dr nehra see call for help and all that you know uh, you know things to do steps and the mnemonics you people have all that is important only for theory 
you should know any woman who's got a emergency like a ectopic pregnancy or a plus in a previa or a ruptured uterus please give resuscitation first and once resuscitation is done how you do the resuscitation you'll always call for help you'll have your intern with you you'll have your seniors with you you'll have your anesthetist with you so you'll have help so call for help and do all of that but do resuscitation just that's one heading resuscitation and plan a cesarean section for a plasma previa which is bleeding all right so um that's passive okay most cost effective that's fine please uh, antenatal visits sumaya antenatal visits are four we say four antenatal visits that is what is required one in first trimester one in second trimester and two in the third trimester four antenatal visits is what is minimal antenatal visits but if they ask you who and the who model of the ideal visits is eight in number ideal visits is eight in number at least four that's what we say in india all right um next session next session we'll discuss with the preparator team uh abortion update for 2022 no new updates have come this 33 weeks nobody's answered back i've asked you what is this 33 weeks nobody's giving me an answer on that um oh, dr luru once again thank you love from hyderabad always uh severe preeclampsia termination pregnancy is done when severe preeclampsia terminate when you see it when there is severe preeclampsia don't wait for the eclampsia to get worse so you asked a very good question if there is eclampsia you terminate immediately don't you either you do a normal delivery or a cesarean when the patient is convulsing you give max self reduce the blood pressure by um, iv labetalol and then go ahead and do the delivery that is what is eclampsia now there is severe preeclampsia patient is about to throw a convulsion then give the max self control the bp and plan a delivery in next few hours you will plan a delivery you'll either induce or do a cesarean depending on the situation the patient is in all right so that is termination of pregnancy is not like diabetes in diabetes you have to terminate a pregnancy something like uh, uh, when the patient is having a good control on gdm con uh, you can deliver by 39 weeks also controlled on insulin deliver at 37 weeks uncontrolled deliver after 34 weeks that is what is diabetes but in a case of uh, preeclampsia which is very severe then plan the delivery now even if it is 32 weeks severe preeclampsia not treated by drugs she'll throw a convulsion all right fine updates in williams sukhveer please don't waste your time if there is an update which is required we've already discussed this in the classes please go ahead and stick to the basic notes in your exams they're not going to ask you updates on williams obstetrics please i'm telling you that straightforward on a recorded forum on youtube i'm telling you that please read the outright basics if there is one out question which is coming from williams and which is an update very bad too much to ask for a mci exam or even for a pg entrance exam but yes if you know what has been discussed in the classes and in the uh, uh, preplatter forums and on the uh, uh, previous year questions and the exam videos if you know all of that you will do well in your exam okay right guys uh, i think i'll take your leave and if there is another session which we can uh, vipul patel thanks for the love and uh, if you guys understood in this session i'm very happy and if you have still more doubts and if there's a forum which is open like a telegram which you were asking me i'll be discussing with my team and if all of that is done i'll be happy to come back and discuss more with you but the punchline is still the same our notes what we've discussed in the classes and then the mcqs which you've done with you people like this session today and the inict and the mci exam this you should do if you've done all of this i'm happy more than enough preparation after that if you have time go ahead to uh, see your doubts in um, your uh, shaw's gynecology and holland and bruce obstetrics all right and uh, may god bless you do very well you can always get back to me at uh, any people who are not on prep ladder but you want to get back to me you can get back to me at dr prasan at yahoo.com so this is a dedicated email for my students who want to ask me doubts you can come to this if you're not on prep ladder doesn't mean that you cannot ask me doubts go ahead and ask me doubts on this one and if there's a preparatory forum coming up, then uh, Telegram, then I'll be more happy to come back to you. Guys, write a very good exam. You got that extra time. Don't think that you don't have enough time now, at least. Please revise and please don't get fooled by reading new books. All new books, all books are good. Every author works very hard to write books. But 
you have read in one particular way whichever teacher you picked up please stick to that teacher all teachers are good everybody has that basic information which is required for passing this exam so do not mistrust your effort and do not mistrust your teachers that's my carry home message do a very good exam and write back to me on this email that each one of you passed this exam all right thank you so much guys best wishes bye bye